Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Lead Volunteers Podcast. Grateful that you guys are here. Excited. Today, we have a fun interview today. I'm excited to jump into that in a minute. But I want to let you know, if you don't know this already, we're not... There are times, not always, but there are times where we are doing uh, the podcast and we're recording it. And I would call this Lead Ministry Live. And so, yes, we have the podcast, which is the audio, but I know that there was a couple of people who got a hold of me and were like, mind blown. I didn't know that you had videos of this. So yes, you can go to a YouTube channel. And uh, and so that's kind of fun. So excited for today. Uh, don't forget, of course, this is brought to you by the, the Lead Ministry Courses. Our flagship course, of course, is, of, of course, is, course, is called Lead Volunteers. So grateful today to have Sid Coop. Sid, how are you? Hey, real good, Josh. Great to be with you, my friend. Really yes. Cool. And so it's kind of fun. We've uh, I love when we go international. And so you are a solid leader from the great uh, country of Canada. <laughs> I don't know that I've ever actually been introduced that way, Josh. I'm uh, I, I'm I'm taken aback. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. You know what? It's great being up here in Canada. I love. Uh, I feel like God's called me here for sure. I said to my friend the other day, I said, man, I got to tell you, dude, if, if I didn't feel so called to this country, I would be somewhere warm right now. Right. So that would, that would be my dream to be somewhere a little bit warmer in the South, but I think that'll have to, that'll have to wait for a little while yet. Yeah, yes. Great to be here. Well, yeah, it's good to see you. And you know, I got to tell you, I have been to Canada quite a few times and I love it. Uh, uh, it's so chill. I mean, like it, you go there and everything's just a little bit, it's a little more mellow than the States. Am I right? Am I wrong on this or am I right? Yeah, you know, I think that's a, that's an interesting way to look at it. I, I think you could, I, I could agree with that to some degree. There's, there's different places where we're pretty intense. There's things that we're not quite as caught up in perhaps as others. But we're like everyone else. Hey, listen, dude, if we're going to sit down and watch a hockey game, you're going to see a level of intensity here <laughs> yeah. that you may not see in some other spaces. I'm not going to lie. So it just kind of depends what the issue is at hand, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Well, I'm super grateful. I'm glad that we connected. And you've got a lot of great things to offer. You've been doing this for a long time. And, and we're talking today about how to build a successful volunteer team. And that is right up my alley. That's a total passion area yeah. for me. Okay, so before we jump in, I'm talking like 20, 30 seconds. Tell us just a little bit about yourself and the organization that you run. Yeah, great. So the organization we run is Youth Worker Community, Josh. And, and our vision is to encourage and equip youth workers to better disciple kids like next week. So we want to be really practical with what we're doing. But we also want to do it in such a way that can help them stay in it for the long term. And when we're thinking about a youth worker, for us, a youth worker is defined by someone who wants to help the next generation know Jesus. So that's our really core focus. We love point youth workers. We're committed to working with point youth workers, but we really love volunteer youth workers because we believe, Josh, that volunteers are often in the most significant role with students, especially in a healthy youth ministry environment. But so often they don't have the kind of equipping that can help them really be faithful in terms of stewarding that role of responsibility they've been given. So we're pretty excited to be able to work with youth workers. It's, it's our pleasure and our privilege for sure. That's awesome. And so when you say point workers, is that a, that's a yeah. Canadian term that we would say in the States, like staff, staff members. Perhaps. So one of the reasons, Joshua, we use that language is because a vast majority of youth ministries in Canada are actually led by volunteers. Understood. So in a sense, they would be staff as a volunteer, perhaps, with an organization or a church, but they're not paid. And so for us, we just said, hey, who's the person that carries the greatest burden of responsibility? Understood. When I'm working with my team, I'm always looking for the person who uh, who doesn't sleep real well at night. That's generally the person I'm going, oh, yeah. you carry it the most. Okay, let's yeah. work with you. Yeah, so like that. the differentiator is who wakes up at 3 a.m. <laughs> thinking about this ministry? Correct, you bet. And if I've got nobody that's waking up every once in a while, then I'm a little bit concerned. You yeah. know what I mean? we got to figure out how to get some more ownership going on. That's well, that's great. super. I like that. I like that a lot. That's super fun. Well, Sid, grateful that you're here. And we are going to jump in right now and kind of talk about this. Again, we kind of follow this. Let's define it. Yeah. Let's develop it. Let's do it kind of platform for our, our people. Mm -hmm. And so number one, why are you passionate about developing a volunteer team? Yeah, so Josh, here's why I'm so so passionate about this. I really believe that that if we want to go deeper with students, so help them be rooted in their faith. And by the way, we need it more now than ever. 
because the complexity of the environments they're living in is greater than we've seen before. You know, their access to information uh, makes it almost overwhelming in terms of yep. the various worldview perspectives, et cetera, et cetera. So we got to go deeper with our students. We want to go broader with our students. We want more kids to know Jesus. Got to sure. get more kids to know Jesus. So we're going deeper, we're going wider, and we want to do it in a sustainable way. And so in order for us to do that well, I really believe that the number one task of a point leader is to develop a healthy youth ministry team to be able to do it. And the other part of it is, of course, we know that it's the, in the context of relationship where kids faith is grown and rooted and developed. And so we've got to fight to create those kind of spaces. Now, here's the interesting thing, Josh. I think that if point leaders are going to build the kind of team that are going to do really effective ministry, fundamentally, we have to change the way we think about our volunteers. And, and here's how I think we have to shift it. Oftentimes, when we think about a volunteer, we think, how can we help them serve us and our ministry? And instead, as a point leader, we've got to shift and go, oh, how can I help my volunteers steward the calling that God has placed on their lives, right? And theologically, of course, we believe in the priesthood of all believers. So this, yes, is, that's exactly I mean, this right. is what it means to be a follower of Jesus, right? Like we're here to continue to give glory to God and help other people know Jesus and love Jesus and love others. So this is our calling. Let's do it. You know, yeah. and in youth ministry, we have this unique space to be able to do that. And the funny thing is you said quite a few things that are very noteworthy to me. Number one, if, if people can understand and accept and lean into their calling, that is an absolute yeah, game bro. changer. They're not helping me yeah. fulfill my calling. I'm yeah. like, I'm, I'm teeing up and, and setting things up for them to fulfill their life calling. So that's huge. Um, yeah. And, and, to, and to provide a, 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 a space where somebody can realize their calling. Okay. Second, you said, we want to go deeper. We want to go wider. We want to get more people and go deep with those people. And then you said something important. You said, but it's got to be scalable. And the only way that happens is by more leaders. Because I could, yeah. I, I always think about it like, like Legos, I can only have so many little spots to place people. I can't have deep, ongoing relationships with 50 people. I can have surface relationships, but maybe six, eight, 10 that I can really go deep with. So I need a bunch of more leaders in order to do that with a bunch of kids. So I think we're definitely on the same page as to why you're passionate about this. And everything you said, deeply affirmed for sure. Well, yeah, wonderful. Now, what I want to ask now is you you spoke to me about seven key practices, right? And so like as we develop this, so we understand like the burden of why we need to do this and why we need more people because uh, because the one person who's waking up at three in the morning, they need a team for sure. So talk to us. What are, what are these seven key, Kevin, seven key practices? Yeah. So for me, Josh, what happened was I was looking at my volunteer teams and we were blessed with a good culture of volunteerism in, in the youth ministry that I was overseeing. But there was this dissonance in my mind that we weren't we just weren't quite being as effective as mm -hmm. I knew we could be. And of course, that burden of responsibility, I felt directly on my shoulders. So I started sitting down with my with my best leaders and I said, hey, what can I do? to best support, encourage, equip you? Like, what can I do to help you be better at the calling that God's placed on your life? And so as we did the interviews, we started coming up with a few categories that we started going, oh, this is resonating really well. And of course, frameworks, Josh, like, I believe there's no such thing as necessarily a right framework. There's helpful frameworks. Sure. And so, you know, we just built out a framework that we found really helpful for us. I thought it was something that we discovered that I just then as I continued to read, I found every leadership book was basically saying the same thing and had been doing so for, for generations already. So like any good youth worker, I stole it and we made it our own and away we go. And so there's seven practices that we say are really important for a point leader to lean into. Now, I want to be careful, Josh, when I say this, that I'm not talking about seven new programs. And I think that's where sometimes yeah. point leaders, both in youth ministry or children's ministry, can feel a little bit overwhelmed when we kind of start laying this list out. So just stay with me, just we'll walk through and then we'll give you a little bit of vision on how to kind of apply that within your context that I'm praying won't be overwhelming. Because remember, our goal isn't just scalable, it's also sustainable. I like so that. So we wanna help our leaders, you know, we believe that leaders of good character are more effective the longer they remain in, their, in the context that God's placed them, okay? so. Here's our seven practices. Should we just dive in, Josh? Sure, absolutely. Dive in on this? Please, please. Wonderful. Okay. So the first one is inspiration. 
I really believe that one of my great responsibilities is to help answer the question why for the leaders that are in my care. Why are you doing what you're doing? And, um, and the reason why that's important is because any healthy youth ministry is going to cost you and it's going to cost your leader something. In fact, what we say is that the more effective a youth ministry is, the more messier it will become. I love because that. Kids will begin to unpack, you know, what's really significant in their lives. I remember sitting down with a point leader one time after we'd been, you know, dealing with the issue of pornography, and he just came to me. He said, "Dude, none of my like, I'm really thankful you talk about this, but none of my kids deal with this issue." And I just remember sitting there going, "Oh, <laughs> the issue isn't that none of your kids deal with this. The issue is that none of them trust you enough to allow you to be a part of how they're dealing with this. That's really what's taking place." So, right? so well put. So well put. Yeah. So for us, it's really important to continue to inspire our leaders to help them understand what they're doing is so significant. There's a few ways that we do it. We want to tell lots of great stories, mm -hmm. um, stories in terms of where we've seen leaders really be faithful with God's calling on their lives, stories of kids who have great needs. We want to make sure that we're continuing to point to our mission and what it is that we're about. And so we just continue to want to lay that in front of our people. Now, here's the other part of it, Josh we know that passion is caught like it's it, you know teaching is always a part of it but it's caught right that's right so then for us if we're going to really inspire our team well we have to be guarding our own passion so you know what god's called us to and we have to be modeling that in front of our leaders also so the first one is inspiration we think that's really key uh, the second one um, is clear communication. So we want to make sure that we're really clear on the expectations that we have for our volunteers. Mm -hmm. uh, really practically speaking, if we want to get super practical, what that means for us is our goal is to never ask a volunteer to join our ministry unless we can place a job description in their hand for Love the role that. that we're calling them to. Yeah. And there's two parts of the job description I think are really important. I think it's not just a responsibility of doing. The doing is important. We think about what are the tasks that we need. How much time are we going to ask from you in terms of weekly, monthly, yearly, mm -hmm. but also the responsibility of being, who do we ask you to be in our ministry and not just in our ministry, but beyond our ministry. And so we just really feel that as a point leader, um, it, you know, if my people don't have clarity in terms of what they're being called to, that's on me. In fact, 100%. You know, you know, Josh, right? Yeah. And you'll know this, Josh, anytime as a leader, if I have, I, you know, what I would call a gap between what I'm expecting from somebody and what I'm actually experiencing, uh, you know, in, in order to try to figure out what's creating that gap, the first thing I do is look at myself and go, okay, have I clearly communicated what I expect? That's got to be the first place we go. For sure. Right. So it's, it, it, yeah. it, it's, it's, if, if you're not seeing what you want, don't look out the window, look in the mirror, right? Yeah, we yeah, you know what we say? We say eaters own leaders own the gap. So anytime there's that gap, you gotta own it first and, and step in to try to close that gap. And and yeah. the first place I generally look is in that area of communication. So that's the second one. Am okay, I, I wanna say communicating what I expect. Yeah. Yes. And I would say in kind of the lead volunteers ecosystem, we would call that a metric for success. Do they know really? do they know for themselves at the end of a given night? whether they whiffed it, whether they hit a home run, or whether they hit a grand slam. Can they themselves measure? And another yes. thing, every opportunity I get to say this, it does not, like so many job descriptions rival the Westminster Shorter Catechism. And I'm like, bro, no one is reading that. Like, <laughs> no not, not even full sentences, just a, a phrase with something underlined that's an action word, right? So I love this. Yeah, this is good. good. You got to communicate. Yeah. And, there, and, and keeping it simple and accessible is really important. Here's the deal, Josh, when we're looking to recruit volunteers, and you know this already, to be honest with you, it's the people who are busy that I really want, because there's oftentimes a good reason why they're busy. That's right. There's but the, if yeah. I can't clarify for them what I expect, I'm not going to get them because they're really, um, they're generally pretty aware of the kind of time they have. And so if I can clearly communicate what I'm asking, they can know if they can jump into that space. And then once I got them, Oh man, I'm just going to expand. I'm going to I'm going to steal from them everything yeah. I can get and continue to expand their place in our ministry. No problem. It, you know, with that, I I always say, you know, I want to turn them into service addicts, just like I became a service addict, right? All right, number yeah, three, it. number three. What do you got? <laughs> yeah, number three is equipping. So my responsibility is to give them the tools and resources they need to do to fulfill the responsibility that I'm asking them to fulfill. Yes. 
And so, um, uh, you know, one of the things that we discovered in our youth ministry, Josh, is we said, hey, you know what the truth is? Our volunteers are the most, if I want to use this language, and I'm cautious about using it, but but phrase it this way. They're the most significant asset we have to doing effective ministry. I so understand I, what you're right? saying, 100%. Right. So if I have a great volunteer, I don't need lights. I don't need cameras. I don't need the show. Now, all those things can be helpful in what I want to accomplish. But the reality is my great volunteer committed to following Jesus and loving others in a relational role of kids is going to be the game changer. We were working with a, with a church that was going multi-site, and they asked the question, you know, at what point can we launch a youth ministry because we need to be big enough to have critical mass for a great program? I said, oh, that's awesome. Two volunteers, three kids. Let's go. Like now <laughs> we can it. launch a great youth ministry. So then the question is, how am I equipping those volunteers to do their job? And one of the ways we kind of um, evaluate is where are we putting our resources? Yes. So when we realized that, we just took a look at our budget and said, oh, we need to put at least 25% of our budget directly into our volunteers. At least that. I would even I would venture to suggest up to 30%. And that means things like my volunteers should never have to pay for a retreat with our kids. Why? Because if I can get them to that retreat, that um, quantity of time spent with kids is going to transform the rest of the year. And so I don't want any barrier. I want to remove every barrier to sure. getting them into that space because that's so key. So I'm paying for that. We would gather our volunteers every week uh, before our youth night to eat together. Uh, you know, when we I just like did once that. a month training. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when we did once a month training, Josh, I got maybe 60%, 40 to 60%. But every one of our volunteers had to eat. A majority of them were young adults. So we gathered them an hour before our night, and we were up to 90 95% of retention. And so then what we did is we had to pay for their food. That's no problem. And we had to advocate for it before our, you know, our budget committee. Uh, but we could make the case and say, hey, this is really significant in terms of shaping our youth ministry. And our volunteers are the most important. I mean, food, food brings people together, period. Yeah, dude. And, 100% yes. And I would say, I love what you said about resources. And so number one, you have a, a financial resource and okay. you have to steward those well. You have space yeah. resources that you have to yeah. allocate and say, okay, how are we going to use this space? But you also have a human resource and those are your volunteers. Yes. Absolutely yeah. critical. Yeah. And then think about this. So when we equip our team, it's not only in terms of about getting the resources to them, but it's also about the structure that I've developed to facilitate their ministry. Right. Love so that. one of the great shifts we had to make was to go, oh, how we define success is really important in terms of equipping our leader. So, for instance, it used to be if I had a great program, my win was if a young if one of my kids came to me and said, hey, Sid, that was such a great night. We had so much fun. Thanks for those two hours. What I started looking for was a volunteer leader coming to me and saying, hey, Sid, those two hours were amazing. I had a great shared experience with my kids, and that's reshaped my relationship with them way beyond right. this moment. When it came to speaking, I used to look for kids to come up to me and go, hey, that was a great speech or, or talk, Sid. Super funny. Thank you. Now what I started looking for was my volunteers coming to me and saying, hey, Sid, thank you so much for setting me up for a really great conversation with our kids and allowing us to go deeper in the scriptures. Uh, you, just, you just helped set me up to be able to do that type of ministry. And I'm like, oh, that's part of my equipping responsibility, that's right? That's so good. That's super yeah. good. Okay, so we're talking equipping. That was number three, is that correct? Yeah, correct. Okay. You nailed it. Yeah. Let's go on to number four. Yeah, number four for me uh, was accountability. So how do I hold my leaders accountable to the expectations that we've agreed upon? And again, this isn't just in terms of doing that simple and easy. It's also in terms of being. So the reason that's so important, Josh, is all the research that we've done and any research you've seen, you know that when it comes to passing faith formation on to the next generation, mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. is modeled in someone who is older than them where faith is authentically modeled, that's where we see the most radical change. First, of course, in parents, but then second in, a, in terms of another older person. So we believe so, I mean, first of all, as followers of Jesus, we believe in holding one another accountable. I think the radical nature of the gospel is not just that we belong to God, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me, but actually that we belong to each other, right? I love like that. We as followers of Jesus are accountable to each other for sure. So we want to create that as part of our cultural ethos. And we want to journey with our leaders because of the significance of their role. Now, in order to do that, of course, 
We make sure all of our leaders sign off on a code of conduct and a covenant. Those are important parts that are connected with our job description for sure. Part of our plan to protect policies as well that we need to be doing or child protection policies in our churches. Now, the other thing I want to say about this, Josh, is especially in a cynical environment, when it comes to accountability, accountability for us isn't primarily confrontational, although that's part of it, but it's also invitational. I want to invite my leaders to a better way. Like God's way right. isn't just right. It's good. And I'm not simply using my volunteer as a tool for my students. I care about them right. as followers of Jesus and my responsibility to shepherd them. And I want to invite them into a better way of being. So yeah. that's number four. I love that. I love that. One thing that I would say, I completely wholeheartedly agree. And I remember somebody came to me one time and they said, hey, man, what's the best curriculum? And I said, that's a great question. Uh, the best curriculum is a sold out volunteer who loves Jesus Christ yeah. is, and, and is walking in the spirit. That's the best curriculum. And they said, yes. yeah, but, but what about, what about like, you know, the actual curricular resource? And I said, Hey, listen, if you give this person who's walking with God and loves Jesus super, super, super a lot, you give them a crappy curriculum. It's a great curriculum. Every single time, every it, single time. If, if you no. give a person the best curriculum on paper, but they're not walking with the Lord, they're not submitted to the Lord, and they're not tuned in with eyes for people, that curriculum stinks. It's all yeah. about, so couldn't agree more. I think that's genius. Okay, so we're on to number, yeah. I believe, five. Yeah, real quick, it's support. So how am I emotionally and spiritually investing in my leaders? And, and here's the question that I'm just asking myself, Josh. I'm saying, am I putting into my leaders what my ministry is taking out of them? And so, wow, again, wow, wow, wow. I, Push pause on everything. That's super good. Yeah. I love that because there is a cost to participating. Oh man, I've never heard it stated that way. That's really good. So yeah. you know, for a fact, as a leader, that, 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 that stuff is being extracted from them, time, energy, vitality. And so your job is to say, if that's coming out, how am I putting back? Super good. Keep going. Sure. And that's our responsibility as pastors and shepherds, right? And, you know, one of the hard adjustments, I think, especially in youth ministry. Now, children's ministry is different because our structure is primarily programmatic, whereas in youth ministry, we start shifting over to relational. So it, it, it's really different. But for me as a youth pastor, I had to make the shift to go, hey, I still want to pastor and shepherd my kids. That's why I got into this. But I have to shift a significant amount of my energy to being the primary pastor and shepherd of my volunteers. Love that. And facilitating their role as the shepherd of kids as well. So that became a real shift. Okay. Okay. Uh, this, yeah, good. Now, I, I want to say one quick thing. Um, I remember years ago when I was in in camp ministry, right? So in my summers, I was a camp counselor and I had eight to 10 kids or 12 kids and my primary responsibility was to pour into them. And then I kind of like was tapped for a leadership role and it didn't take me very long to say, okay, well, those 12 counselors who are leading kids, those are my campers now. That's who. And so it's the same thing. People say, wow, Josh, you must love kids. If you're in kids ministry and say, well, you know, I actually do. However, my job is to love leaders who love other leaders who love kids. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not always an easy shift. Part of what happens to Josh is many of us are in this and we're doing it in, you know, our intuition is high. So we're leading, you know, out of intuition. And when we shift up, we have to kind of take what we do instinctively and figure out what are the principles that we can now apply to our yes. other leaders. Right. Yes. And that's how you actually help be really intentional about forming culture. And, and culture, you know, architecture is important, uh, content's important, but culture is the game changer. And so that's how we actually kind of reshape that. Yeah. yeah. I had a young leader say to me, hey, I really don't know how to, to lead adults. And I said, well, I, t tell me more. I, I knew where I was going, but I wanted to get yeah. more from them. And they said, I know how to love on kids. I know how to love on students. But I just don't, like, I'm not even, I feel like I'm a fish out of water. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And I said, well, tell me the things that you did with those kids. They named those. And I said, stop. All you have to do is apply those very things to the people that are leading others. Exactly. So, okay. Number, I think, six. Is this correct? 
Number six, yeah, we'll hit six and seven real quick here. So number six is building community. So we really believe that um, one of us does not have all that we need to do this work, that together we're greater than the sum of the yes, parts. I God's agree. actually designed it that way. So we all have unique gifts that we should contribute. And so for us to function out of the context of community is really important. We put lots of effort into our volunteer team, feeling like a community, working together, synergizing together, uh, supporting each other. Do you know what I mean? And so all of those things are important. Here's what's fascinating, I think, about that, Josh. One of the most effective ways to build healthy community, too, I'll say, number one is be on mission together. So when you can have a clear mission that you're engaging together, that's powerful in bringing people together. Number two is actually playing together. And I think when we play together, we do the holy work of offering each other dignity and loving each other well. And theologically, by the way, Josh, in our cultural context, when we can play together, it should be a reflection of this concept that says, hey, I realize we're in a serious space and it's difficult and hard and broken, but we have a God who ultimately has it so we can rest in that. And Love even in the midst that. of the tears and the struggle, we can still enjoy one another you know, well and appro- contextually appropriate also. So community is really key. And Go I think ahead. this community piece is huge. I think that that um, yeah. I, I would tell people, hey, listen, if you come to serve with us, I know it's not a good trade, but you get me. You get a relationship yeah. with me, and I, you're going to be one of my best friends, so let's do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? You so got that right. Yeah. It's community, yeah. And you're going to be a part of, a, of that team together, especially with young adults. Like, we know that we need intergenerational leaders in our youth sure. ministries. But let's be honest, you know, many of our volunteers are young adults, which is great because teenagers have this age aspiration where they look forward yep. to that next stage of life that yep. they want to engage in. That's wonderful. And young adults, you know, like all of us, but are, are dying to belong. Of course they are. And it's that context of belonging where we understand identity and where we understand purpose. And so, you know, when we can be intentional with that, again, you know, you turn the dial just 10% in that area. Yeah. And the results are so significant. Absolutely. Okay, let's hit number seven. This is great. Yeah. Finally, celebration. So we just think that we want to be a context that celebrates really well. And, you know, you mentioned it earlier, Josh, if we're going to celebrate well, we need to make sure, like, what are some of the goals that we're shooting for? Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the questions I'm asking myself, am am, am I celebrating, you know, what God celebrates? And, you you know, what what does that look like? And really what I think God celebrates is faithfulness. Mm -hmm. And so for us, we want to create markers of faithfulness for our leaders. We want to enjoy it a lot. We want to celebrate each other when they do that, when we see uh, them, you know, really modeling Jesus way well with kids and loving kids really well. Yeah. And then we want to celebrate um, faithfulness in terms of people who have been with us and are maybe being called out into something else. We want to celebrate that too. And we want to commission and, and know that we are, you know, we are a part of something bigger when it comes to the body of Christ and, and his kingdom work. And so we want to do whatever we can to help people as they move into other areas that God's calling them to as well. So if we can be a community of celebration, I just think that's such a game changer for our, for our ministry that we're involved in. Yeah, and what's hard, uh, and I, we've all experienced this before, uh, you've you've poured in, you've developed community for years, and this person is now literally ready to go fulfill sure. their larger ministry calling, and yeah. they're leaving the area in which I serve. And I had to create a culture that said, that is a win, that's not a loss. Now, it's hard, but still. It's hard. So, Josh, here's, I think, the vision. Here's, the, here's part of the vision I think we have to yeah. cast. Um, I think as, as point leaders, especially in youth ministry and children's ministry, again, they're, they're different in the way that we engage both of them. I understand that. But we need to understand that um, because many of our volunteers, especially our young adults, we are training up the lay leaders of the church for generations. Yes. And I think, especially in a healthy youth ministry environment where our leaders are placed in significant shepherding roles with groups of kids, I just go, I can't have a better place to prepare them to lead people well beyond our youth ministry. If I'm in like, the, you know, when I'm working in, the, in, in areas in our church beyond just youth ministry, what am I looking for? I get one weekend a year maybe to train my volunteers, maybe two if I'm lucky. Do you right. know what I mean? And then, right. you know, rock and roll, go do your thing. I'm meeting with my volunteer leaders every single week 
for we are dinner. Clarifying expectations for, for dinner. dinner, bro. We're we're praying together. We're clarifying expectations. We're debriefing and processing. We're re-engaging. Do you know what I mean? Over a longer period of time, Man. the complexity of their work is with parents, with students, with schools, with friends, and it is shaping them. And I just really, you know, part of what I feel my calling is is for our youth ministry now. Absolutely. But it's actually for the church for generations. And so we yes, carry that, that responsibility, which is part of why we continue to celebrate our leaders on to other endeavors. Absolutely. You know, and you, the thing that I always measure for myself is, uh, you know, when they have this wonderful moment, uh, uh, they're yeah. at a leadership retreat 20 years from now, and they say, who was a person who greatly, significantly influenced right? you? I want to be on that list. Come right? on. And, and yeah. And I, a big takeaway for me, Sid, is, I mean, I, I just celebrate the idea that you have budgeted legitimate dinners for your leaders. And I will guarantee that that is a not to be missed dinner. Everybody is coming to that because it's valuable. Yeah, on, well, on, on a number adjust. on a number of fronts, it's valuable relationally. It's re, it's yeah. it's valuable from a training standpoint. So many pieces to this. A mentoring standpoint, yeah. they want to be around you. Oh, even even in terms of transitioning into my evening, right? So my leaders are coming from all sorts of parts of life. That's, and that's exactly there, and right. They're carrying a lot into the space. Totally understandable. We don't want them to just leave it at the door. We actually want to bring it into the community. We want to help carry it. We want to pray over it. But then we also want to dial into what God would have for us for the next few hours. That is so and good. And so, you know, that space is so important. Josh, I want to just, I want to speak to it for just a quick second here. In our ministry, and, and lots of ministries are going through interesting financial times right now. So you have budget cuts. We have different sure. things like that. Um, and I understand it. And we went through the same. I remember when, when our elders really started saying, hey, I'm not. this is a pretty big budget item. First of all, our leaders came and said, hey, this is the most important gathering mm -hmm. we have. We'll go to the elders for this. Now, I want to be clear. When we started, not everyone was super on board. You know what I mean? They saw it as another hour a week that you're taking out of, you know, I get it. So we had to help them experience it. And we had to be prepared to use that time really well. Point leaders, don't waste your volunteers' time. Preach. Be prepared, right? Let's use it really well. Let's steward it well. They've entrusted that to us. Let's make sure we steward that trust really well. Here's the second thing. We used to like um, order in from McDonald's and stuff like that, which sounds cool. But once you've had 10 of those in a row, you're dying. You know what or I mean? pizza. You or pizza. Only, right. Yeah, 100%. So here's what we actually did. We actually got a group of parents who oh, signed I love up to this. say, hey, we're going to prep all the meals for the this next month. This is genius. Month. And then they signed up groups of parents to come prepare and serve that meal every week. And what happened is it was a real tangible way for parents to come and say thank you to our leaders for yes. the work they were doing with their kids and for those parents to actually see the ministry in a non-intrusive way and become, begin to really Dude. appreciate these people who were like speaking into the lives of their kids. So Dude, my this is so good. Went, well, oh, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Okay, Sid, I got to say, like, I, I, I'm sorry, but we have to do a second podcast at some point strictly around the dinners because that's genius. That's genius. Well, listen, okay. um, super grateful that you're here. Just tell us real quick about your ministry one more time as we close out. Yeah, great. Hey, Youth Worker Community, we're really thankful to be a part of it. We do a number of different things, but you can see those at the youthworker.community website. Um, you know, we began with conferences. We have a two-year school where you can get your graduate or undergraduate degree with us as well. We do a lot of digital work also, and we do coaching and consulting. So it's just a real gift, Josh, to be able to continue to give our lives into passing faith on to the next generation. And we're really thankful um, to be called to this and to continue to have a platform to be able to do it from. So, well, Josh, thanks so much for having us here. It's been absolutely. A great work. Super grateful that you're here. And Sid, I got to tell you, expect another invite because that dinner thing is going to come back our way. <laughs> I love it. That's great. All right. Well, gang, thanks again so much for sticking with us today, and we will catch you guys on the next one.